Um, I'm just going to outline kind of my basic assumptions because it's always good on t times to know what somebody's viewpoint is. Um, so my basic assumptions, first of all, I'll use technology. What I think of as technology is basically kind of anything digital. Computers, tablets, interactive whiteboards, software, video, smartphones. You know, some people go, yeah, but could a, white, could a, a, a whiteboard marker be technology? Yeah, I guess a pen could be technology. But I'll, generally, when I use technology, I kind of think in digital. Um, but kind of all flavors of digital, whether it's video or software or hardware. Um, and obviously, it's going to continue to evolve. My teaching approach, my view is the teaching approach is and will always remain the key. Right, the MOOCs, the technology, the slickest course by iWatch or Apple Watch, it's not going to replace the teaching approach. Sitting in front of a video of somebody being video, a lecture being video recorded, is still just really poor. Uh, so the teaching approach to me is always the key. Uh, technology will change how we do things and how we teach. Technology I see is properly placed in the learning environment, it's kind of an accelerant. So if you put it in the right spot at the right time, it can really help the students learn. And I also see it as a support mechanism, it's almost a, to support the scaffolding of what you're trying to do. So if we all know we have the A student and the B student and the C student and the D student, uh, is how some of them all need different levels of support. So sometimes the D student needs more sample problems, right? You always get the feedback. Do more sample problems. You're like, I do 15 sample problems, you know, how can I do more? Well, that student needs more. Okay, how can I give, how can I use technology to provide that student more demonstrations, more examples, more real life stuff, more, okay, how can I use technology to do it so they can go get what they need? Because you, you can't cram it, cram it all into 50 minutes. Um, and then I also see the technology as supporting teacher diagnostic and formative assessment. How, how, are the students prepared walking into the class? And then during the class, how are they doing? What are their misconceptions? What are their areas they're struggling with? Um, like on a video, where are they pausing? How long are they taking to watch this video? This video they're speeding through. This video they're pausing a lot on. This is a lot more difficult than I thought. So maybe I need to break it down more. But getting that diagnostic feedback that I'm not sure you could get in a normal, I don't say normal classroom, typically in a classroom of silent students. Um, I always see that my assumption student learnings uh, usually Student will learn less than we teach, sadly. Uh, how much they learn, it's a function of ability, uh, background, motivation, work effort, teaching style, how they feel that day, did they get sleep last night, did they drink too much, did they play Xbox, are they in the middle of, uh, they gotta schedule their classes. There's so many factors about how much they're gonna learn in that class. Uh, but I, I can only affect one. And the only one I can affect is teaching style. So the way I teach is the only thing out of that list of probably hundreds of items of what are they going to learn today? I can only affect one. So that's what I got to focus on. And uh, kind of my guiding principles. Uh, balance. A variety of approaches are important. Students have different learning styles, the way they view stuff, micro to macro, macro to micro, quantitative, verbal, pictures. Everybody's different. And I got to respect all of them all. So I got to have a lot of balance. Don't just do this, but do a bunch of balance. Uh, basic skills, high level skills, lecturing, active learning, individual group, it's got to be a variety. A soup, like a good Nathan soup. Uh, we were talking about Nathan soup before people arrived. Uh, constructive alignment. I got to make sure I align my stuff in class, out class, and assessments to the same learning objectives. So yeah, for each class, I try and have four or five learning objectives. For each chapter, I may have eight or 10. For each test, I will give it to them. These are the 12 things you need to be able to do. Here it is. Here's the test from last semester, by the way. Don't go find it at the fraternity. Here it is. Here's what you gotta be able to do. Be able to calculate this, be able to do this, be able to analyze this, so it's just clear. And then hopefully, I keep them in mind when I write the next test. Um, but also what I'm teaching that day, whatever. So just a lot of alignment of what you can do. And then I like a lot of practice. I think of microfeedback. I haven't seen microfeedback, people are talking about it, uh, but microfeedback cycles of students practicing and then getting that immediate feedback. I found that, and probably you've all seen. They take the quiz, they take the test, 
Great. As they walk out, here's the answers to the test. I'm posting them, but here's that microfeedback because they only really care mentally. Maybe they're in that state. And if you grade it and you hand it back a week later, what do they look at? They look at the grade. They're not looking at, where did I go wrong? Where did I? But if you say, hey, you just took it. Great. As you're walking out, here's the answers. They may go, oh, I didn't get that. No. Where did I go wrong? And they may mentally process it to improve their learning versus just look at the grade. So those are kind of my, my basic assumptions. Um, so what do we know about learning environments? I think learning is social, it's conversational, it's constructive. It's not transmissive. And I, I, know, I know right now I'm doing transmissive. I couldn't come up with a good social conversational. I think we're going to get to that, hopefully. Um, it's not a transmissive view, right? Lecturing, stage from the stage, doesn't work. 18%, uh, I think, of the numbers I've seen, what students learn. Social, conversational, constructive. They've got to, whatever you're going to do, work together, talk together, construct their own knowledge. So it's got to be constructed by the students from themselves. They have to be meaning making uh, versus knowledge transmission. So making meaning, they use artifacts, they use devices, they use, they interact with the environment, they interact with things. Um, to make to make an understanding. Uh, low sh uh, I see learning as social dialogue process, and then active learning is I def kind of define as anything in the course that related to the course that students are called upon other than simply listening, watching, and taking notes. So if I say, okay, think of this question, talk, uh, you know, write down yourself what you think it is. It's a great little tool. Write down what you think it is. Great. Now talk to your, share it with your partner, the think pair share, great. Now it's kind of free where I can call on people. But that act, typical active. Uh, but obviously we all would never just say, you know, what do you think? And just call out of the blue because that is just setting the person up. They get it right, stigmatized. They get it wrong, stigmatized. They don't answer, stigmatized. It's like lose, lose, lose. Especially to underrepresented groups. So. What from technology works? Uh, and we st I started with some of the people in my department using the TLT. We started playing with tablets, uh, I think back in 09. So we've been doing, this is kind of what we found that we think works from a technology point of view. It is a rich mixture of visual and verbal, you know, not just one, not just the other. A lot of self-test, microfeedback loops, um, you know, give the students the ability to Solve this, try this, think about this, do this. And then give them that micro feedback of yes, or yeah, kind of, but, and adjust them. But the, a lot of those little micro feedback um, to assess, you get feedback, but they also can adjust their understandings. Practice and problem solving methods or approach with immediate feedback. I love the immediate feedback stuff, if I haven't mentioned it enough. Uh, media available to be viewed at convenient places and times, right? Read the book ahead of time. Yeah. Watch the video. And the nice thing with the data analytics in Ensemble Video Server and in my courses is, wow, they're watching them at 2 a.m. They're watching them at midnight. They're watching them on an Android device. They're watching it on an Apple. They're watching it on our IT property. They're watching on a different property. They're watching. You get all that data and you go, oh, that can help me a lot and adjust my delivery because now I know what some of them like to do. And, um, but they have it available because we know. Uh, students have life emergencies, deaths in the families, grandparents, aunts, uncles, sicknesses, illnesses, flu. Is You can't just, sorry, you can't come to class. I got to go to my grandmother's funeral in Ohio. That's fine. Watch the video ahead of time. Take the online thing. You're not going to miss anything. Solve these, you know, versus, well, that's too bad. Um, anonymity, I touched on it. Anonymity in getting things wrong. I think anonymity is very important. Um, you know, what what we all, the students, they don't know it. And it's learning is hard because you have to say, I don't know this. I have to admit to my peers, I am not good at calculus. When I think all of you are, uh, or I assume all of you are, and I'm the only idiot. So anonymity to me is very important. Whatever you do, it's gotta be anonymous. It's gotta be um, anonymous so that, especially underrepresented groups, Multiple items to support students, example problems, demonstrations, experiments. So that's what I think works from technology. So what I do uh, and continue to evolve, it may not be the right, it, it's kind of like everybody, try it. 
is they do the flipped classrooms, uh, lectures, video, sample problems, demonstrations. I organize them by lecture, and I just release them by lecture, and I send a note before every class, usually two days before, which you just keep in a Word document, cut, paste out from semester to semester. It looks like you just wrote it, but you know, hey, test is coming up, you know, little reminders, watch the pre-lecture video, there will be a, there's always a quiz. Um, watch the pre-lecture video, watch the next pre-lecture video, and they're just released. And I think, I don't know, maybe I have 100, 200 videos in my courses, so just tons of resources. There's a lecture video, and then generally there's sample problems. Some are cartoons, some have rap music in them, some are whiteboard examples, some are paper examples, some are demonstrations. And the beauty is the students go, that was a good demonstration, but you know, I have a farm, and then this, and you go, great, make a video. Or, that was a good sample problem, but what about this? And you go, great, make a video. And they do, and then you just double, triple your, your library pretty quickly. And they become very creative, and they do cartoons, and they throw in the latest music that I might not know, um, and it appeals. I start this class, I always do a schedule review, you know, some of the housekeeping stuff. I always have a question period, okay. You'll be amazed. After the first few classes, when you start getting them uh, used to the system, they'll write notes. And to me, it's, I always smile, because if I said, read the textbook and take notes, nobody's going to do it. OK, you'll have the one student. But nobody's going to do it. But you say, watch the video and take notes, because you can use it on the quiz, and they'll do it. And so usually the first two week or two, I'll go, anybody have any questions? No. And you'll see the person who took like one, two pages of notes say, can I? Can I show your notes? And they'll be like, sure. And you go, you know, a good thing is this. You're kind of teaching them how to learn that, hey, this is a good process. And they'll be amazed at the end. They'll have handwritten notes for every lecture, two pages, beautiful, in their little binder. And you go, that's wonderful. Um, and so then I jump into the quiz. I do it open notes, closed book. So you can't use a textbook, because otherwise they just use a textbook. Um, and so that they're, they're their own, they make them personal. And so most students take one to two pages of notes. I would say 80% take them, maybe 90%. It's really high, which is, I don't think I could get anywhere close to that in terms of read the textbook and take notes. No, probably that's 9%, maybe. Then, okay, let's go do a problem. Hmm? I, th I, I don't know. I, thought, I don't, don't know if you said, read the textbook and take notes. They'd read it, but they might not take notes on it. I don't know. I tried it just for a little bit. I said, hey, read the textbook, take some notes on it. And it was like, hmm. But then it's, watch the video and take notes. And my video usage, because you can see it now. right? If I say, read the textbook. OK, anybody have any questions from the textbook? No questions. I have no idea. Did any of you read it? Or did all you read it and understand it? But with the videos, I can go, you watched it, and it was a 10-minute video, and you watched it in eight minutes. You didn't pause. You fast-forwarded twice. You got it. You took 15 minutes. You paused. This is a little harder topic for you. You didn't watch it at all, because Jeremiah's a slacker. Uh, but you know, but he got 100 on the quiz. So, and I can go look. At, oh, he's a fifth-year student. Okay, he's taking out a sequence. He's really got it. Or whatever. Or you got a zero on the quiz, and I can go, hey, I see you, you struggled on that. Did you get a chance to watch the video? And they'd be like, no. You know, you know they didn't. Is there something I can help you with? And they all, no, no, I didn't. But it reinforces it. You know exactly what everybody did, which is kind of nice. I never tell them that, but it's kind of nice to know where everybody's at. Because reading, you don't know. Scott, um, where do you get all the videos? I make them. Um, so I did them in the little studio over here in a while. And then I found the little stuff over there is pretty cheap. So I convinced my department, can you buy me a mic? for $100 and a piece of software. And I think we may be moving towards a site license. So I think for $100, you can have it in your office. So it's That is. And it's very easy. So I did all the lecture videos. And for the first time, I was doing like two weeks ahead of time to allow time for captioning. And now it's fixing up a little bit, changing things a little bit, maybe making more sample problems. But then you get the students making them, and you just, boom, explode. They'll go out on Lake Ontario and make a little video, and you go, that's a darn good demonstration. The, they'll float different beer cans to assess the alcohol. And he's going to go, 
I couldn't do that. That's a good idea, but just nice feeling. I, yep. Well, they're all in my, my courses, but then I'll release the week. You know, release, I'll just release them by, they're all draft. So I'll go in in August, copy it over, draft the whole thing so they're, they're all gone, and then just re, uh, publish, publish the first week one. And then publish week two, then publish week three, and then usually one is, okay, go see it. Because I think if I said, boom, here it is, and they'd be like, what? But if you kind of open the book one page at a time, it's not nearly as daunting, I don't think. But plus they get to know their way around. So the layout for every week's the same. Pre-lecture video, sample problem videos, lecture. Next one, pre-lecture video. You know, I just keep the same, that's why I try and do the class the exact same way every time. There's always a quiz. There's all, I'll always talk about the thing, I'll always ask for questions, It'll be the same format so there's the students just get into the habit, they know it. And then I think that it's easier for them to follow. No, they can watch. I, I know I can track it with Ensemble, and I've looked at from the server, they watch it. I see Android, I see Apple, I see various Windows operating systems, I see almost everything. I did have one problem six months ago, Apple, I don't, the name, Graham Cracker, whatever the heck it was, wasn't, wasn't compatible, but that, that got fixed in a week. So I think they can watch it on any device. Yes, and I see Apple, because it, it'll record what iOS they're using. And so you'll see, oh, they're watching on a MacBook, they're watching, which is kind of, Creepy, but you can see exactly what they're watching it on. Then we go into active social cooperative learning. Um, so I used to do it with set work on problems, but it was the needle in the haystack. And it was really hard for me to figure out where everybody was at. And then it was also hard for me to approach them without interrupting. So you kind of did the, uh, then we used tablets. And I could peer over, I, but I was up in the front. And I was basically peering over every shoulder going, this group's doing OK. I can watch them. Great. But they're kind of like, why is he over there? You're basically peering over each one of their shoulders as you're going through them. From a software point of view, I can look at what everybody's doing. And that, yeah, I don't think they knew what you were doing. They're like, what is he doing? Right. And I think probably it could be to, what's he doing? Is he updating his Facebook? Is he playing Clash of Clans? What the heck is he doing? So we said, yeah, we've got, it's got to be visual. So then we, we kind of evolved to interactive whiteboards, um, where it's kind of where we are now. May not be the right answer going forward, but put it up. They all work on interactive whiteboards uh, around the room. So the th three of the walls are covered with them. And they hook up their computer, or there's a, a, some computers provided for those that are financially challenged, don't have a computer, or don't want to bring it. Uh, everything's up in my courses. They download the problems for the day. I'll release them before I go to class. So before, in my routine, I'm gonna pick up the whiteboard markers, make sure you brought the quizzes, grab your bag, don't forget the darn charger, release the whatevers. In my list, release the problems. So by the time I get to class, it's up in my courses, and it's okay, here's the quiz, great. Go to the quiz a little bit, let's do problems. They all, first week, a little training, from then on, they're in their groups, they pop up, get within their groups, and solve problems. And I can just look and go, doing great, doing great, need help. Doing great, need help. And then I've incorporated the, if you have a class tutor, a TA, or a learning assistant, somebody who's helping you, and generally they're outside the class, I bring them in the class. So my tutor, it's like, come at half an hour, 20 minutes before the, at, before the beginning of the class, and that's where we're doing problems. And he walks clockwise, and I walk counterclockwise. And now they know their tutor, they know their support. They come to the tutor sessions, they come to the tutor review sessions because they know, in this case, Chris, they know the tutor. And I did it before with Matt. They, they know the person versus walking up going, I don't really get this. And you're gonna start judging me because I'm gonna ask stupid questions. So I don't think I'm gonna come ask you because then I have to 
that anonymity, expose myself that I really don't know what I'm doing. And then uh, you as a third year student are going to start judging me as a second year student as, oh my God, this person's an idiot. Well, you were in the same stage a year ago. Um, so I try and incorporate them in just for that. And then, go ahead. No. The same every single class. Uh, in my favorite tools, I have a page on my favorite tools, tools I like, CatMe. CatMe is, I think, the tool for smart group formation. So CatMe, you put them all in in August, um, but CatMe is it. CatMe will make sure, uh, so I'm in engineering technology, so in a typical classroom of maybe 30 students, we'll have a minority of female students. Well, from group studies, you don't want to have minorities that are underrepresented groups in the majority still a minority in the group. You, they want to be a majority in their group. So it will recognize genders, it'll recognize racial backgrounds, it'll recognize leadership styles, it'll recognize grades. Because you want to put, don't put three A's together, because they're gone. Don't put three D's together, or GPA-wise, you know, all 2.0s, because they're going to struggle. You want a 4.0 and a 3.0 and a 2.0 together. You know, and you want them all blended, and you want them all with different, the various leadership styles. I like to lead, I like to follow. You recognize the gender, recognize the deaf students, recognize all these variables. You used to do it with index cards. It used to take me hours. Fill out this index card and they'd be like, okay, this one maybe, would, no, that's not gonna work. And now it's click, form the groups. Beautiful, yeah, I don't like this one. Reform, don't, don't put these two together because I know they hate each other or whatever. And reform, Ref and it's just, you know, computer program, and it's boop, done. And they're all stratified by grade, stratified by, it's stratified by all these principles that you want, and you can set up whatever principles you want. So if you go, I want, I've had a problem with, I don't know, fraternity brothers being together. I don't want them together, or I do want them together. People in sports on the same team for scheduling, it'll also recognize scheduling. They put in their times available, because that's a major failure this is mainly inside the class. I do give them a project. They have to work outside the class. Some, hey, I work. I'm not available Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the day. Well, I'm not available Tuesday and Thursday. Well, that group's not going to work. Is that recognizes all that, puts them together, and releases it to them. So CatMe is it. It's NSF funded, been out for years, uh, free. So they go do their stuff, and then everything's digital. So they submit it all digitally to my courses. Makes grading beautiful um, because it's all there. It's all by groups and all interface with the grade book. And then because of the feedback stuff, the answer is always at the bottom, generally. Uh, so if it's a big problem, the answer is 6.25. The answer is the problem, 6.25. Well, grading's really easy because you go match, match, match. Great, 10. They usually don't walk out unless they get it right. And it stops them because you know they all do. We've all done homework. I think I got it. You didn't get it. You got it wrong. Um, but now they'll stop and they'll go, Professor, we're getting this, and it's supposed to be this. And you go, well, what do you think? And you know, you can ask them, did you check the math? Or they'll check it before they do it. So usually they're calling you up for a real problem because they've said, hey, oh, yeah, really stupid math error. Yeah, yeah. And they laugh and they go on. Um, but they discover their own problems. Um, also in this thing, they play music, so usually, usually now they're dancing, and it's like, man, you guys are having fun learning engineering. This is really strange. Um, so it's a lot of fun, and then you'll see me in the picture. I end up being kind of the guide from the side, where you just, um, I'm kind of on the second board there. Um, and you're just guiding small groups of students, so you're teaching three, or teaching two, exactly what they need. And the ones that got it, great, keep going. So they're all at their own pace. They have a lot of autonomy. It's not like we've all been in the thing of, let's solve a problem together. You finish, you finish, you finish early. You three never finish. You get, it's bright pace for you, and it's always the wrong pace. Class is too slow, class is too fast. Now it's, you're solving a problem. Go as fast as you can. You finish 10 minutes early, God bless you. You need more time, fine, it's digital. Save it, work on it later, right? It's all everybody's own pace. And then everybody's all stratified, so generally it evens out. You don't get the three A's together that finish in 10 minutes. So what tools I like? Uh, I like CatMe. Uh, we talked about that. I like the Ensemble video server um, for video submissions, capturing. 
the data analytics of who, what, when, where, how long students watch stuff. Um, I like Camtasia, site license question mark, and put an exclamation point, exclamation point now. Um, I like the in-office video creation, now and in, I think David's probably the expert at it, but now and in they'll, I don't get a few students, because they're engineering students, so they're not quite as good as your students. They'll send me a little video about their problem, so I can make a little video and send it back to them. But that talking by video is nice, because uh, the talking by paragraphs is tough. Because now and then when you're describing something, just go here, pull this down, and you're like, they're not going to get this when you start writing a paragraph. But if you make a little video and you actually show it, they're like, oh, this was great. And then you can have it, fix it up, and put it on my courses for a future. I like uh, Powtoons. I don't use it as much as students do uh, for cartoons. Um, obviously, my courses for Dropboxes, grading, content organization. I like the international whiteboards um, because I like to see the visualization of it. So whether it's interactive whiteboards or whether it's just whiteboards, the disadvantage with the whiteboards is any work they do, we tried that, they take pictures of, and then they submit pictures, which is kind of okay, but it's kind of clunky. Because then they have to download, or they have to upload it, they have to put it into a PowerPoint, you know, it's like all these steps versus save, submit, Dropbox, and then 30 seconds, they're done, and they're walking out, versus we'll take pictures of it, yeah, you're going to put it into PowerPoint or Word or something, or send me them as separate JPEG images, and then you're opening them, and it's like, man, this is clunky. Um, so I like the interactive whiteboards for that. I did have used tablets for that, too, except the tablets, they end up, they're here, and you're walking behind them all the time. And even though you're the instructor, you're the, they have a lot of fear, I think, when you're walking up, they stop now and then, and they're like, and you're like, keep working, and they're like, did are, uh, you know, it's kind of like, what are we doing wrong? Where I can stand 15 feet away in the big 100 inch whiteboard and go, oh, they got a unit problem. Walk over a little bit. How are you guys doing in this? What about this? What about this? You know, you can assess it and walk up and fix it or ask probing questions. And then I like designing the tutor or TA into the classroom. Maybe. Some, I don't know if it's whiteboards or maybe it's, it's like right now I, have the lock I need a projection screen. Right. And it's, oh no, I need a, you know, I say, yeah, like it's, not a like a projection. it's a projection screen with their coding. You know, I think if you had six or eight of them and they're all coding and you could just go, beautiful, nice approach, but a little flawed. Okay. I got to talk to them. They're good. They're way off. They're way off. I'm going to go there first and then you, like your TA. Or if you have a helper, you go there. I'll go there. Or you can just see it after a while. I think making it visual for you, because walking behind everybody, I felt like I was searching for the needle in the haystack, and I could never, I've always felt, did I miss that student that needed help? Because you walk down the row, you walk down the next row, and then you're, after a while, you're running out of time, and it's like, they're done. Do I, do I keep going? But. So that's why I think the technology help the students. It's also got to help me. So whenever I try and think of something, it's, it's got to help me. It's got to help me be able to diagnostically, informatively assess where they're at. Make it visual. Make it visual for them. Make it visual for me um, so I can see where they're at. So I can see in coding, oh, yeah, I can see something where you could see exactly where everybody's at. And then you would know they're all good. They're all good. Just, just hang back or who to talk to and who to ask what question to. Because I don't know about coding, you're probably fantastic at it, but to walk up and go, hey, where are you guys at? Hold on. You know, it's like, you gotta mentally process it, but you can do that from a distance, and then you approach them and you can fix it. But I always felt walking behind them was har hard to see exactly where they're at, because everybody's doing a different process. Is that true in coding, or am I generalizing? Is it easy? To, okay.
Oh. Oh no no, they would be maybe like typing it. And, and just projected. Right. Like writing code would be horrible. Yes. You, if you want to do diagnostic on a code. But if you want them to write code, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think having them do it and then project it onto something, the nice thing is if they project it onto a whiteboard, is you can write over it. So this is good. This is whatever. Mark it up. Then erase it. Versus, okay, move over. Let me start typing. Let me fix it. You can just write. And go. What about? And then you kind of like move over and. Yeah, exactly. So that's somewhat a a projection screen that you can write on. Because I think. You guys would hate if we started writing on stuff and calling, yeah, there's permanent marker on this screen. Can you replace it? Um, but that's what I use it for. So I usually walk around. You can project. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're all HDMI, VGA. You can project if you wanted to up front. Now, this is where it gets all the fancy stuff. You can project up front onto every board. You can take control. You can do all these really fancy things. Or you can just, you guys work on these. And I'm just going to walk around and I'm walking around with a whiteboard marker and a microfiber cloth. And I'll walk up. Hey, that's great. They're writing digitally. And I'll just check this. Is this, di is this right? And then I go, oh, no, no, no. Then I can just erase my thing, but I don't have to kind of take control of their process. I can just overlay onto it and then just erase it. And then it, they're not submitting it or write, write notes on the side or whatever. It's kind of, I like the idea of writing over their stuff versus writing on a screen. There's only one of these. I think so. Just Neil's got to just build one over the, over the summer. No, this is in Brown, Brown 1100, or Brown 1110. <laughs> no, it's a general use classroom. It's Brown. Nobody goes to Brown. <laughs> Brown is the Agway building. It looks like an Agway building to me. Uh, behind imaging, across from Crossroads. It's like on the set by S lot. So it's not, not a highly desired building. But hey, great. It has this great classroom in it. Each one is about, I think, $1,200. They're pretty cheap. $1,200 for these. And then you just put it on a whiteboard. So each projector, I think, is twelve to fifteen hundred. Oh, so we did the whole classroom for about twenty thousand, and we put in there are nine, no, eleven, ten total projectors. There's a lot. They're on three walls, so it's, you need a panoramic picture to take a kind of a picture of them all. So there, it's a regular whiteboard. Yeah, the project. I'm not gonna think of the technology. I don't know. Somehow the projector knows where the marker is and digitally you can write in colors. Yes. And there's a blue, whatever, tip ones. The markers are pretty cheap. The bulbs are pretty cheap in the things. We've gotten to the evolution where we're now putting these in our labs, our, our, like, la our little laboratory classrooms. because, And we're thinking of hopefully in the summer putting them into the students' project room because they usually have a need for, they work in groups. How they collaborate, you know, they all kind of get around a laptop. That's not very convenient. Why not project up on it, be able to write on it, capture it digitally, put it down um, into something. I do it in uh, fluid mechanics and fluid power. People have done it. Wind power, materials, um, people are doing graduate classes in it, undergraduate classes in it. People are starting to think creatively because it's digital, right? You don't all have to be there. So I think in the fall, people are saying, hey, I'm going to try this, and I want to invite a high school to participate with me. And all they have to be is on the other side, but they can write on that board from Edison Tech and see it. And there's also cameras in the ceiling um, where they can see it, they can participate. 
or hey, we have a big problem with international students, especially with online classes, they don't get engaged until we go there, which is six weeks after the quarter starts. Maybe we need to get them so that they're writing wherever they are and it appears together so they're working in a collaborative space with on-ground students, with distant students. This we can just start getting digitally crazy because all this stuff can just do it. I think 14 people can write on a board at one time from 14 different locations. I mean, it's just, right, it's, it's Apple Watch. Oh my God, it can do that too? Oh my God, it can do anything. Uh, conversation time. We kind of did it, but I wasn't sure. What's your preferred approach for um, groups that finish before the end of class time? Good luck. Huh? See you later. Yeah. Have a good time. Because mm -hmm. I know it's A, B, and C. So they're all individually responsible, and they all know you're getting tested individually. Quizzes are all individual. So make sure if you're doing group stuff, keep in mind, the individual is responsible as part of the group. So they naturally, I don't know what it is, but they start teaching each other, uh, which is kind of beautiful. Um, and they'll start teaching each other across boards too, which is fine too. So they'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, you guys got a problem here. And you, cause you, you'll see it and you'll go, oh, they got a problem. Ooh, the other ones are jumping in. Beautiful, I'll just sit back here. And they'll just teach them and say, yeah, he mentioned this, remember in the video of this? Yeah, this is a key point, and you're like, I'm gonna get coffee. And you know, and you, you kind of feel a little weird. At least I f now and then feel weird because it's kind of like, what am I doing? But you've done it all the pre-work. That's what I keep telling myself. Yeah. Doing all the pre-work. My dean walks in and goes, we're paying you for this? What are you doing? I, say, I did all the pre-work. Um, but it does feel a little weird. So I don't, I don't care when students finished. Most of them, hmm? No. That's the homework. Because I look at it as, you did the video, you did the notes. Instead of banging your head for half an hour, 45 minutes doing homework, I'm going to give you it all in pre-work. And then here's the homework, here's the work. Generally, I try and size it so that they get most of it done, 90% of it done. So I'll have some later. And then I look at the test as big homework opportunities. So when I say two weeks before the test, here's the next test. By the way, here's last semester's test. They all do it. It's like free homework that I don't even have to grade. And then see that the tutor's having a review session three days before the test at six o'clock at night or whatever. Most of them come, they have all the problems worked out and they're just checking answers. Yep, this is great. He explains it to them, whatever. It's like, wow, it's like extra homework. They don't even realize they're doing extra homework. Um, I know the notes, I'll say, bring in the notes. Um, so this way I can make, I found that I can make, you know, we all, you hear some instructors say, well, I taught them A, B, and C, but you know I'm going to write a test problem that combines them all and some really stretch them. And you're like, if you didn't teach it to them, that's not a good idea. You got to teach them how to combine. So I use those things of, well, give them last year's tests that have these combination problems. They're like, whoa, gives them time to work it out. Gives them time to work in the groups. They figure it out. They're it's, I'm not there, but they're learning how to combine these complex principles. Then, fair game to test them on it. Because, hey, you had it. And I'll give them some opportunity to ask questions on it. But I can kind of use that extra time outside the classroom um, versus filling it with homework that at times I wonder if it's just do 20 calculus problems. You know, like, I get it in three. Do the other 17. Why? Just because I want you to. You know, is it just busy work or is it really learning time? So I don't know. I always struggle with that balance. So I've kind of settled to the side. Of, I'm going to do most of the homework here. I'm not going to use a lot of homework because it was repetition. I thought. You're, again, I, I think my, I'm evolving. I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, I'm starting to do that, hopefully in the fall. But Grades. I hear you saying something else is perfectly valid. Um, just knowing the context of when and where students are watching videos gives you some rich stories about how you should use these videos. What are, what's an example of some of the strongest data stories you've heard? Well, I think a lot of it, and some of the papers I've read on it, is 
and I think you'd expect it. You don't really need to paper about it to think about it. Is there, we're all uh, uh, just-in-time consumers, right? When are 80% of your students going to watch the video? Well, you plus it at 10, they're going to watch it at 9, or they're going to watch it at 8, or they're going to watch it at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 1 a.m., right? It's the exceptional student that watches it two days ahead of time. So, okay, I got to make sure these are nice and condensed and short. These are not, these are 10 minutes. They get to the point, have a lot of things that, you know, is not because I know what they're watching it for. If I give them an hour video and they're going to watch it 10 minutes before class, it's not going to work. But I think there's a lot we can get from that by just thinking about how they consume it. So how, many, how much video time do they have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Eight, 8 to 12 minutes. I just summarized the lecture. You know, think about what you would do for a lecture is you may lecture, then may, you may, I used to do two or three example problems. They'd all nod. You get it? Great. Now you try. They'd all fall on their face. It's like, I'm just going to skip that. Why am I doing these? Is I just skip that. Condense the lecture. Here's a lecture. 10 minutes. Here's the high points. Great. Go. Try problems. Here's the quiz. Go do it. Uh, because I, my view is, I think I construct their own knowledge. I can't transmit it to them. Knowledge is not, I can't take it out of my head, Harry Potter-ish, and put it in there. It's, you gotta construct, you have your own framework, whatever that framework looks like, and you gotta construct this knowledge on top of that framework, relating it to what you already know. I can't do that for you. So I can give you, here's the highlights, now let's do the problems. And let's walk through it. Let's do the exercises because you've got to create your own knowledge. You've got to make meaning of it for you. So it's different. It feels different. It feels a lot different. What, I'm sorry. This might turn out wrong. What are you grading? I grade the homeworks. I grade the tests. I, grade the pro I give them a big, big, big old project. The homeworks are in class. Yeah. Still grading the homework? Yeah, at the end. They submit them. And then some of it's... You got them all done. Great. You, did, you finished 90% of them. They did the other 10% out. Great. They submit electronically. Usually it's due a week after class. 90% of them, 80% will finish it right in class. So the grading is really easy. because you. Yes. So there's where you might go, Joe and Sam were there. Pete wasn't. So 10, 10, 0. Now, no, they do it. They do it right for you because you say, First sheet, yeah, guys, each week, just put, put who's here. And so that first sheet would be like, they just write their names on the board. And you go, four of them, four in the group, beautiful, done. Three in the group. So electronically, you're writing their names on the Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of all there for you. And it's like you give them the answers? Yeah. So the answers are done at the end. Because what I found is they would work out the problem, they would stop and go, is this right? And then you'd have to go, yes. Can we go to the next one? Yes. And you're doing it for each, and it's like, go. Be autonomous. You want to be autonomous. They, you know, you want to work at your own speed. Go do it. So they know. They get the end. Check, 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 check. Great. See ya. You go, you got it? We got it. Beautiful. My job here is done. Yeah, it took me, I, the first semester I did it, I was two weeks ahead of them in making the video. They're only 10 minutes, so you're using your lecture slides, condensing them down, thinking, oh, there's a nice YouTube video I can find. There's a nice demonstration I can find. That's the other thing, I've, I like doing it in my courses. I don't have to worry about, maybe it's a bad thing to say, but if I take this little clip from my courses, I can put it in my video, it's for educational content, it's not shared on the world, it's not whatever, I think I'm all legal. I'm looking at David as some of the video experts. I think as long as I don't post it, I'm okay. Okay. But I think if we use for educational purposes, it's within, it's only for the class, you know, there's all that sort of stuff, I think we're good. Uh, that's why I like it, doing it in my courses. Um, but, uh, yeah. Captioned. But the beauty of that is, is all gets captioned. And I think the other beauty that I've, uh, scene that I think is wonderful is the deaf and hard of hearing students will make videos. They will sign them in the technical speak of their discipline, which you get a new interpreter 
and says, oh, I'm new to this class, you know, welcome. He's like, there, go, and I'll mark them, ASL, ASL only. Watch, you know, if you're not sure of the sign for, and I've heard from the interpreters, the certain, the sign for, in physics, they talk about velocity, in engineering, we talk about whatever, the signs are different. You know, there's all these little nuances, is watch the ASL produce videos by the, by the deaf and hard of hearing students that are in the discipline and they'll go, that's a good sign for that. I used to spell that, but now I know. It's a resource for the interpreters. Uh, it's also a resource for the interpreters. They can watch the video ahead of time to get prepared. Yeah, we do. We have that ability. I have some of the ones that they will reverse. No, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's came online maybe six months ago. So I, I put in the request that here's my videos. Can you please voice them? And I think I had to work with a person uh, just to understand a little bit of the background. But it's, I think it's a great resource for the deaf students and it's a great resource for the interpreters. So you can, some of these things have additional uses you wouldn't think of that I think are just wonderful. But yeah, the getting it started, do one, I'm looking at Martin, I think he's going to do it in the fall, do one video at a time, stay a week in front of them, don't expect to have 20 problem videos, but once you get started, you you'll be, a, on right? yeah, so it's kind of strip them down. Stri Oh yeah, yeah. Any of this technology stuff. There's some people that go in there and just use it as whiteboards. Don't use the digital, or just uses whatever. It's great for student presentations too, because it becomes a poster session where they can put up their their maybe their coding, and great. Rotate, mark up, mark up. You know, you're blue, you're yellow, you're green. Mark up a color. Mark up their work. Okay, two minutes. Switch and becomes like a just a big poster session. If you want to do something like that, you can do a lot of. I would say you can do a lot of things. But yeah, the work is tough. Yeah. I think the only things you need Camtasia, which is now site license, and I like a blue not the color, but the manufacturer microphone, the USB. And I think the group here will give you a list of preferred software, but it's, it's really short and it's really cheap. Right, it definitely shifts your work to pre, but hopefully less post, hopefully less post. And hopefully better for the second time, because now, hey, watch the video. That's all done, and you just do it. And then, again, they'll they'll add to it uh, with ease. This is. Oh, no, they they'll just volunteer because they like making videos. It's fun.
Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, they'll write to you and say, I've done everything right, and it still doesn't work, so why not? And I can see the why. Yeah. Yeah, or it could just be like, yes, two days ago, one of my students was doing something on Scala, and I just was sensing this dream of Java that it was like, how can I have like one slash 2.3 in my shell? And I'm just like, nothing's working! Right. Or if they sent you a little video of, Fraser, I'm having a problem here. This cell's not working. Here. Now, I opened it up, but this is my formula, but it's just not working. I don't get it. Can you help me with this? Stop. Send. You'd be like, quick video. This is what's going back. Notice, just put the equal sign there, and it works fine. Put it back. And then you may go, well, that's a common problem. Let me put it up on my course's site. How to put equals? I don't know. It's, that's a little trivial, but so like, I, this is week nine. I don't, they're all by week. So I got about 260. Um, and I'll have the pre-lecture video. I'll always post my lectures. Here's the problems. And then the, the next lecture, and then there's all the sample problems. And so this is just for that week. And I don't know what these are. Oh, there's, oh, there's an ASL one. Um, generally, they're made, and I put a little front end on them. Um, and I don't know if that's necessary or not. But I put a little front end just so that they all have the same look and feel. And then they'll all have a title of what's the topic. This is nothing in Camtasia. This is 10 seconds in Camtasia. What do they give you? On what day would it be a sample problem? Would they look at them in class? They, they could. So if they're working on a problem and they go, oh, we don't get this. Well, let's go look at a sample problem. But generally, they'll do it before a test. Then they'll do it before class. Um, they'll do whatever they're trying to do. And I don't know. Some of these have music. Not this one does it. So, yeah, so they can skip through them and they can go, oh, I, yeah, I, I get this or I don't get it. This is a minute, a minute and 15 seconds. So it's pretty fast. Right. That's, th th this is Powtoons. And if Powtoons is very, it's free. It's very simple for them to do. And they'll create a simple sample problem. I go, hey, I want to share this one. Great, beautiful, make it, submit it. Um, now and then, if I have students that have like a problem on a test and go, you did the test, but you got a 60 because you don't understand this. And they go, I do, I whatever. Okay, write me two new problems on that, different from this. Write up your own, make, solve it in detail, step by step, describing everything, your misconceptions, what you didn't understand, and then solve it explaining it and submit it to me. And so I'll use it as a, as a teaching tool where, okay, because I, I think the whole thing of if you can teach it, then you kind of know it. And they'll go and they'll do that. Here's one. Yeah, then I'll give them some points. Because now and then on a test, um, they just didn't understand. They think they, whatever. I want them to learn it, right? My objective is not to give you a 60. My objective is learn this in week three because it's part of the class, and if you don't know it, you're going to get killed in week six, and week nine, and week twelve, and on the final. Um, so, it just and you, so this is like a deaf student will come in in a second. So he wrote it out, did it on a whiteboard. So this one's a little long. This is three minutes. So, yeah. But you see, they'll they'll put the effort in, and they'll do it, and they'll describe it to others. Yes. And I think you can put the request in and the, they'll do it. Right. Oh, we were talking about that the process is there. The voiceover process can be done. It's got a uh, turnaround time that's even longer. So why just go about three weeks turnaround time? But it can be done. Voiceover with captions. So right. while we have this, can you confirm that these videos can be seen? Ensemble server? Nice. Where is this ensemble 
video that no it's uh video yeah there you go And it has a nice reporting. So this is the ensemble. So this is one class, one class of 28 students. I have 13, almost 1,300 views. So it's 28. So, and it gives you when are they watching them? What are the most popular ones? What are they viewed? And then you can drill down into those. Oh, they like this introduction. Great. When are they watching it? During the quarter? Where are they watching it from? Oh, they're watching it here. They're watching it here. Where? Okay. So this is one. Wow, they're watching it throughout, kind of throughout the entire semester. This is under the, oh boy, I got to go back. Right. And it'll take you to your video library. Now, you won't have a video library if you never use our service Right. Right. Yes. This is where it goes. They do. So if you give it a, I think two weeks, yeah. lead time, you send, I send a note, TLS Media Services. Uh, and then I uploaded two new videos, can you please have them captured, hit enter, and then you don't have to worry about it again because you know if you're giving them lead time, it's there. When you're making the videos, do you have to, where do the captions go? Are they, they do it. And maybe it's only in my courses. Oh, you could probably look at all, any of these. Yeah, I, I have it done anyway, because I find students, English is a second language students, students that are not as, profi 
proficient will use the captioning. So I look at, I always look at it as, oh no, this is for every student. Um, yes. It, Right. Right. As a, as a classroom, we get the transcript, the raw transcript as well. So you might want that text document to be the captioning of my courses. Anyway. Yeah, generally, um, SRTs, can I correct you? Because I use the word SRT. Oh. You just they're MP4, right? Just MP4. Yes. And you don't need the highest definition of MP4. Uh, there's three different levels. The middle of the road is fine. So 720 in Camtasia is fine. Well, we have a question related to the technology. Oh. Do you have to have additional resources as part of the class beyond your pen and video? Like there's a, a backup book? That oh, no, there's a book. Yeah, there's a, there's a textbook. Um, yeah, there's a textbook, there's the video stuff, there's normal tutor stuff, there's office hours, you know, there's the whole general class stuff. It's just the videos are kind of just additional layers on top of it that, because balance, right? There's the student that I absolutely hate videos. I want to read the textbook. I want to highlight the text and go, beautiful, that works for you, great, take notes from it, you can use it. Just don't want you using the textbook during the test because otherwise they, they're like, they read the textbook as during the test, right? They're trying to learn it as they go and it's not helpful. So no, balance, right? Every student's different, got to respect everyone, gotta, I got to provide stuff that fits everybody's learning styles. Yeah, I wouldn't generalize. But that's a bit of a dumb job because they would lose the No, right. No? I, yeah. No, I would never not provide a medium to them because you'll get the student that that's what they prefer. If that works for you, I'll support you in that effort. And now I'll provide other resources if you want to access them too. But yeah. Yeah, because I don't think millennials, like any generation, we want to generalize and say, oh, no, they're all, no, they're not all. So what are the links for the pre-lecture videos? Are they the same links as the lecture videos? This is the pre-lecture video. They're eight minutes. So they're trying to keep them under 10, okay. so five to six. You see all the sample problems are a minute to two, so they're just really fast. Um, and then I'll have like little micro things on problems, probably not Excel, but problems with whatever, little common, uh, we're all using software, we're all using hardware, we're all using a lot of other additional items. So I'll have, uh, you know, mainly the introduction stuff. Uh, I'll have uses, do something on plagiarism, you know, I'll just start doing them all for resources. So how to use some of these programs, overviews, uh, how to use MathCAD, how to use laboratory items, how to use, there's just, a resource on how to do anything um, for these different tools. And then as I like them, I draft them as I don't like them or as what, whatever, uh, you know, just training videos, how to get started on all these interfaces, especially as we're teaching them. And that's just a terrific repository and investment of, of effort so that the time can be saved later on when it's Yes. Well, it's done. 
it's done. So like laboratory setups or things that are just constant, not constant problems, but issues. And now and then students will do it. Or now and then you have the opportunity, David, they'll ask you a question. You'll do it. Oh, great. I can just reform that a little bit and it becomes a nice generic. So what do you do with all this extra time that you've now got in town? You've, you've solved this problem. Now I just apply for awards. <laughs> <laughs> and win them. Yeah. yeah. But has it, seriously, has it, has it assisted your research agenda? I think so. Yes, and it's, yes, it gives you a little more time for this, but it's also now broaden my research because now it's oh, all this data analytics. This is a beautiful data source. Now I can understand not only for my teaching, but then also contribute to how do students learn coding? How do students, whatever, how do these students use these new resources um, to help them learn? Which there's some stuff out there, but it's kind of new. Right? There isn't 100 years of utilizing tablet computers and teaching. So we can all contribute to that field. Charles, how does your department feel about this, the value of this scholarship? I guess it's called scholarship of teaching and learning. They value it because it, it helps the students um, learn. Right? We, the, I, didn't, I didn't do the beginning of the story, but we started, why we started this in 2008 was, we had classes where the DWNF rate was 20%, 26%, 28%, 30%, and you, the D, D grade, W grade, F grade. So DWNFs. Um, so if you take your D students, your F students, and your W students, and just calculate the percentage, um, I think generally the dean's offices look at them too, um, and figure out, wow, we got this class, and we got 20% of the students getting a D grade, a W grade, or an F grade, or withdrawing. That's horrible. So we started doing this because, man, this class historically over the last whatever 10 years was averaging 24%, 26%, something like that, really high DWNF. It's like, this isn't working for them. So we started in this path, and now DWNF is single digit because you always get the student, and I, I want it to be zero, but I'm always going to have the one who has a life emergency and has to withdraw from the class because their parents have an issue or they have a medical issue or you know, this isn't, this isn't the field for me. I got a job and I'm leaving RIT. And you kind of go, ah. but I think the resources and the feedback was, was for the students that struggle, the C students and the D students and the F students, having these additional layers of resources is, do you need more sample problems? Great, here's 10 more sample problems. You know, you have an additional questions on them, come see me. But now at least they have a starting point versus you saw the two examples I could just squeeze into the 50 minutes. Here's the homework. Good luck. And they're like, I'm a 2.0 student. I don't get it. I don't have the background. I don't have the preparation. I don't, you know, you have to understand what they're, where they're coming from is you need to layer, maybe layer additional things, basic and advanced things to help them, help support them. What we saw when we were doing a lot of the research is the, it, the A students and A student, the C's and D students click up, um, they do better. So it, I always looked at it as it helps the, the great students, but the great students probably don't need us. They could just get the book and they'd be good without us. But the students that struggle, the more support and the more scaffolding and the more structure get the most help. And it's kind of obvious, you go, oh yeah, you go, oh yeah, okay. Well those are the people that I'm really here for then. The one that's just maybe going to flunk out and maybe not going to make it, but has great potential, is what help and support can I get them to get their confidence and get, you know, taking notes and learning how to learn skills. There you go. Yeah, that's the one I really feel good about. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.